I began my career as a programmer. I've worked on a variety of web and mobile initiatives for both early stage startups and established enterprise companies. These days, I manage the Emerging Technology Program at iSight Design, a digital experience agency in Portland, Oregon and Boston, Mass. And this gives me the opportunity to work with many organizations at the cutting edge of digital experience and disruptive technology. Your briefing team today also includes Neil Banerjee of Urban Airship, and I will let Neil introduce himself. Thanks, Gene. Uh, so I started my career as an R&D electrical engineer at Hewlett Packard, and I worked on some pretty fun projects while I was there. Uh, if you've ever heard of a memorister, or if you haven't, you should go Google it. It's very interesting. Um, also worked uh, quite a bit in the core printing business as well there. And then I uh, switched over to a smaller company. Um, uh, you may have heard of it. It's called uh, Columbia Sportswear. And I work at the intersection between electronics and clothing. So some of the products that we put out at the time were heated boots, uh, gloves, and jackets. And now I'm working at Urban Airship. And our company has moved uh, a little bit out of the startup phase. And what we help people do is we help to create valuable and meaningful mobile relationships. Um, and some of the products that we have are, that we allow for that is through uh, push notifications. So. Great, thanks, Neil. Well, to everyone online and here in our live studio audience, we're very glad you could join us and spend an hour of your day discussing digital disruption with us. Put simply, this briefing is about what the enterprise can learn from the startup world. There are many popular myths about the way both sides operate, and as with most myths, there's a grain of truth at the center of them. So we'll aim to separate myths from reality today and get to the heart of digital disruption and provide you with some of the tools and techniques that you can use to begin putting this phenomenon in practice in your own business right away. So, what are we gonna to learn today? Number one, what is digital disruption? How do we define it? Number two, why are customer-focused ideation techniques so critical for driving new product development? And why do we have to put the, cu the customer at the center of our innovation techniques? And three, how can enterprise level organizations foster collaborative innovation teams across their entire company despite their large size? So how are we gonna do this? Our program's gonna begin with a brief history lesson, and I promise we will keep this brief, about the practice of innovation in order to really place things in the proper historical context. And we'll really get to the heart of our discussion for today, which is the phenomenon of digital disruption and how you can put it to work. We'll close with a brief Q&A, hopefully give some of you with experience with disruption a chance to share some of your stories. Before we dive into what, how, and why, we really want to start with who. We'd love to know a little bit about the audience here online. So we put together a quick poll. If you wouldn't mind taking part, I'll go ahead and launch that. Our first poll question for you simply is really we just want to get a sense of what size organizations we have in the audience today. So you can see the results starting to trickle in. It's great to watch these polls and see voter participation. And we'll give everybody just a few more seconds to go ahead and vote. And let's go ahead and close out the poll and share some of the results and see what sort of companies we have here. We have a number of individuals, about half small businesses in the audience, a few medium-sized businesses, and about a quarter large enterprise. So I believe the material that we're going to be talking about today is relevant to everyone across that spectrum. It will be especially relevant to our visitors from large enterprises because we're going to be talking about some of the key issues that come up when you try to uh, foster an innovation program and, and get it started that are particularly difficult within larger companies with uh, more structure. So accordingly, we have a second question that is a follow-on to that related. And this is really um, trying to get to the heart of whether the folks in our audience have already had some kind of experience with putting an innovation team together. Uh, so our question is, uh, does your company have 
an internal innovation initiative in place. And if folks would go ahead and vote, um, I'd like to know if you have one in place and it's already mature and generating results, if maybe if you're just getting it started, uh, if you plan to, or if you don't have any plans to launch um, this kind of program within your company. And we're seeing the votes come in now. I'll give you just a few more seconds to finish that poll up. Great, thanks everybody for taking part in that. We'll go ahead and share the results back. It seems that we have a fairly experienced audience, and that's great. I'm hoping that the concepts that we talk about today will be relevant to everybody, um, particularly those who are just getting their innovation program started and maybe haven't really um, figured out exactly how to structure them or are still experimenting with what structure works. As we'll, as we'll see towards the, the end of our program, there are a number of different ways to structure these kinds of programs, and they all have their pros and cons, so we will go through those. So back to our, our plan for the day. We're going to go ahead and uh, there we go. Um, we're going to go ahead and talk about the history of innovation first, and then we're going to get to the heart of what is really our our, um, our program here, which is the phenomenon of digital disruption, how you can put it into practice at a company, and really how you can make it more of a mission for your company and how you can make it an imperative, and then of course some Q and A after that. So diving into history. What is disruption? What is innovation? We'd like to define a few of these things. We hear a lot of, of talk about disruption, how, how disruption is huge these days. We have conferences named after it. We have magazines that have lists of the top disruptors. Pundits love to trumpet the latest disruptive startup. But what does it really mean? Well, after extensive digging, digital archaeologists here at Eyesight Design have found what we believe to be the first sign of digital disruption in the fossil record. And I would like to share it with you today. Does anybody remember Tower Records? I'm sure some of you do. They were a classic example of a wildly profitable late 20th century business. They had brick and mortar record stores around the world. They made millions of dollars and were wildly profitable. And by 2006, they were $100 million in debt and, and then filed for bankruptcy. So who did them in, or at least helped? A couple of college kids and the power of the internet. So while the idea of digital versus physical music in the marketplace may seem quaint now that number one on iTunes has replaced number one on Billboard, at the turn of the century, physical media still had a lock on the music market. And to understand how a tower came to fall so hard and fast, we need to really look at the difference between digital disruption and its predecessor, disruptive innovation. To understand disruptive innovation, I'd like to direct your attention to a groundbreaking, if kind of ugly, piece of technology that some of us may have had. Did anyone in the audience ever have a creative nomad? If, if you did, you can claim your early adopter badge on the way out. Before Steve Jobs promised us a thousand songs in your pocket, creative was trying really hard to fulfill that promise themselves, even if you had to use a backpack instead of a pocket. These early MP3 players, like early mobile phones and early fax machines, they're a great example of disruptive innovation. So what is disruptive innovation? It's a predecessor to digital disruption. It was pioneered in the mid-90s by Clayton Christensen in a book called The Innovator's Dilemma. And essentially, is it cre it's, a, it's an innovation that creates new value and new markets, or new value in a market, leading to the eventual displacement of earlier technologies. Now the interesting thing about this, if you look at cell phones, if you look at MP3 players, if you look at fax machines, is that they start at the fringe. And they start really expensive. And they tend to be long product cycles. And they take some time to take hold. The disruptive innovation in the case of the MP3 player is really twofold. The MP3 format made music all but free to copy and transfer. The introduction of the portable player it enables listeners to carry their collections around with them wherever they go. And there we have CDs and Walkman disrupted pretty much all at once. But it's slow. You know, I remember the first time I saw a Nomad. It was bulky, it was power hungry. 
And the early MP3 sound quality was not great, but it was a sign of something to come. It was a crucial first step towards the way we consume music now. Similarly, advances like cell phone and fax machine, fax machine, they were expensive and clunky at first, and they each fulfilled a key need for a crucial early adopter community. A signal, if you will. You had journalists in the case of the fax machine. You had stockbrokers in the case of the cell phone. Once each of these technologies became small, cheap, and um, mass marketable enough, convenient enough to penetrate the market, they could go on to disrupt their respective predecessors. But disruptive innovation, classically, has been slow. In order to really get to the heart of the difference between disruptive innovation and our current phenomenon of digital disruption, we need to look at another, a more recent example. So how many people have ever tried to help kickstart something? I'm sure most of us have. Did you know at the time that you were engaging in digital disruption, being a digital disruptor yourself? This is Amanda Palmer, as I'm sure some of you know, currently one of the internet's favorite musicians. In the most successful kickstarted album project to start to date, she successfully raised nearly $1.2 million to support her 2012 album tour and book project, which was about 12 times her target budget. In this scenario, Kickstart, Kickstarter takes a small percentage, but nothing like what a traditional record label would have absorbed. In the good old days, artists went to labels, they accepted the artists they felt likely to succeed, and advanced them the money required to record, reproduce, and market an album. The process was slow, clunky, expensive, and it heavily favored the labels, or as they like to call them, the man. With the introduction of a few key technologies that we've seen, most notably affordable high-quality recording software, digital distribution, it's possible for enterprising musicians now to bypass the maze that is the recording industry, tour without label support, and use social media for publicity and Kickstarter to fund their projects. So this is really the essence of digital disruption. Newly empowered entrepreneurs, both inside and outside of large companies, using digital tools to pave new roads to the customer, roads that are more direct, less expensive, and ultimately to the abandonment of other products, and, as the market has found, the abandonment of some established large companies. And that is where the threat in digital disruption really comes into play. So in order to define digital disruption, you know, we go to the source, in this case, James McQuivy of Forrester Research, who wrote a wonderful book in 2013 on the phenomenon of digital disruption. And the definition that emerges from this text is pretty spot on. Digital disruption is innovation in an existing market, typically, that uses digital tools, methods, and infrastructure. And that infrastructure is key, and we'll come back to that. In order to fundamentally change, make more efficient, make more, uh, make more usable, more delightful, the delivery of some product or service. And in the process, it can very quickly change a market. And that's one of the key differences between classic disruptive innovation and digital disruption, is that digital disruption can happen overnight because of the conveniences and the efficiencies that we've gained in the internet age. The industry in question, lest you think the digital and digital disruption is a mark of the kind of industry that can engage in it, the industry can be any industry. It doesn't have to be high tech. It doesn't have to even be that exciting. One of McQuivy's favorite examples is a concrete company that's now using digital tools to improve their, both their supply and their demand chain. Um, the point is that the evolution of digital technology and our understanding of how to use it has accelerated innovation and empowered an entire new legion of innovators that previously had to go through gatekeepers in order to create new products. Another great example of digital disruption is the sharing economy. We look at services like Uber, Cardigo, Airbnb, TaskRabbit, countless others. They've leveraged the power of ubiquitous connectivity and GPS, and in some cases the network workforce, in order to vastly improve the customer experience of users of everything from cars to hotel rooms to cleaning services. You know, 20 years ago, if you needed a car right now, you probably couldn't get one for another 20 or 30 minutes, tops, unless you were standing on the corner in Manhattan where there was already a service optimized for delivering cabs to people immediately. Most places that simply didn't exist. So we've seen some great examples of digital disruption, and there are many others, a few of which we'll look at later in the program. 
But what we want to dig in and explore is why and how digital disruption has taken hold and how we can better learn to take advantage of it. So the first thing that is really key to digital disruption is the emergence of these free and cheap digital tools. A great example of this is the iOS app economy. The cost of entry to develop apps for mobile phones prior to the introduction of the iPhone was staggering. In order to get an app on a carrier network's phone, you had to pay through the nose for some sort of fee. You had to you know, invest in specialized software. And even then, your chances of actually getting an app onto a phone prior to the App Store were pretty slim. Well, with the introdu introduction of the App Store, um, anyone with a Mac and $99 per year can create and submit apps. And the software is free. And there's a robust marketplace, places like Chupa Mobile, where you can go and get essentially frameworks for nearly finished apps and then go and use those to build and develop your own. Second point that's really helped digital disruption emerge is this radically reduced infrastructure cost. If you look at things like Amazon Web Services and all the other cloud services out there, the fact that you know when I started my first startup many years ago, I was arguing with our CTO over whether we could spend the $5,000 necessary to build a database server in order to power our first product. Nowadays, people who want to do that simply go to Amazon Web Services, they provision a cloud instance, and they're up and running for pennies. It's radically different, and it really empowers the creation of new digital technologies. What this results is, is an, it's an overall reduced cost to engage a customer. And in an efficient market, that means that the route to the customer is shorter now, and that means increased competition. So the result, overall, you can get to customers faster. You can develop technology for them faster. You can get things to market faster. And if you can, then so can all of your competitors and all of the folks who want to be your competitors. And that engaging customers, it's really, a, um, it, it, it's, it's, it's really at the heart of digital disruption. And I wanted to give Neil a, an opportunity to share an example of how he's put this into practice and some of the techniques he's seen. So, Neil? Yeah, so I think we covered a lot of uh, software kind of uh, tools that are out there on the market, um, but there's a lot of actual tools that are out there for people to kind of break out of the enterprise mindset where you know, normally you would go and maybe to create a, a physical thing, or in, in my case, I was creating electronics. Um, you know, there's a whole process of execution that you would go through um, that large companies are really good at executing. Um, and so they have all these ways of building things, but they take a long time. Um, and now we're starting to see this emergence of this maker economy, people who kind of do things on their own. And um, when I moved into uh, Columbia, you know, it's a clothing company. And so how do you start doing electronics quickly at, at a clothing company? And I actually turned to look at the um, open source tools that were available to do that. And it turned out there's a whole community right here in Portland, and I'm sure in other places um, throughout the world, where people can actually build these things very quickly for you. Um, and so I leveraged that ability of this maker economy um, and people doing things on their own. It was actually much faster than the way boards were getting built, even at the prototype level um, at HP. Um, and I think, Gene, you had some pretty good examples of 3D printing. Yeah, you know, buy a 3D printer or yeah, there's a, there's online a, tools. If, if you wanted to create a new hardware-based product, a new manufactured product, 10, 15 years ago, the cost just to create a mold for a prototype was prohibitive for most first-time first entrepreneurs. And now, if you have either a 3D printer or access to one, and you want to create you know, uh, some physical thing and be able to test it with potential customers, the printing cost for that is you know, it's, it's pennies compared to what it used to be to, to manufacture a, a prototype of a physical thing. So this is you know, dig, digital disruption really it, it has to do with leveraging these tools in order to radically lower the cost of innovation. And when the cost of innovation is lowered, what we find is this really cool equation that happens that, um, that James McQuivey put into his book that it's really one of my favorite, um, one of my favorite kind of distillations of the, um, of the kind of equation of digital disruption. If you look at the way the old things, the, the way the old, the way, the way the things worked in the old days, you had, a much smaller number of people who were engaged in innovation 
it was very expensive, very slow, and required the manufacture of physical objects. And now with a much larger population of people who can engage in disruption, who can engage in innovation at a much lower cost, with examples like 3D printing, with examples like cheap scalable infrastructure, the result is that there is you know, 100x the innovative power out there in the marketplace, and that power is both, uh, it's both an opportunity and a threat to establish businesses. And what we want to talk about today is how you can make that an opportunity and neutralize it as a threat. So these two phenomena, disruptive innovation and digital disruption, they're related, but they're, they're very different. And I think it's important for us to highlight these key differences before we move on to how we can put this into practice. So in contrast to typically expensive and tech-intensive nature of classic disruptive innovations, digital disruptions tend to take advantage of efficiencies, and by virtue of that, they bring new value to customers at an ever-decreasing risk and cost. And it's that decreased risk that makes the number of innovations that you can experiment with as, uh, as a company multiply. And if you take advantage of that opportunity, obviously, you can have, uh, you know, you can have some great success and disrupt the market. Earlier, we saw disruptive innovation was expensive, risky, slow to market. By contrast, digital disruption cheap, low risk, and fast to market. And if you look at the impact on customers, this idea that classic innovations took time to take hold in a market and had to establish an early adopter community, the time between an early adopter community and mass adoption can be weeks and months now instead of months and years. Um, we've covered a few of the examples there, iOS app market, sharing, sharing economy, crowdfunding, all these things sprung up overnight on the shoulders of the sort of giants of innovative, uh, innovative advances in infrastructure and technology that empowered them. But the actual innovations themselves seem to come sort of out of nowhere. The most important difference here for our purposes, though, is the renewed emphasis on the customer that's inherent in digital disruption. And there are a lot of reasons for that, and it's really at the heart of how we put digital disruption into practice. So we, it's important for us to understand how it came to be, but what we're really here to do today, here, here to do today, is to learn how to be disruptors, how to prevent ourselves from being disrupted, and how to put this into practice in our companies. So we've talked about why it's emerged as a phenomenon. How can you put it to work for you? We have a few imperatives that we'll review. The amount to a recipe for disruption that we've put together, we've accumulated from a variety of sources, and we, we, we think of it as a playbook. And it's a way to do this. Keeping in mind that digital disruption is really all about the displacement and creation of new value, our first imperative is really pretty simple, and that's build stuff customers actually want. And that may seem facile and, and easy, but what you'll find is that there actually is a fair amount of science underlying this, and that traditionally, companies have actually been really bad at this. And that putting the customer at the center of your innovative efforts is step one to, result, to getting good results. And our second imperative is that we innovate the adjacent possible. And this has to do with the proximity of the next innovation, and we will dive deep into what that means shortly. Our third point pulling from the Lean Startup is that we build, test, learn. We have short cycle times, we apply Lean and Agile techniques, and we make sure that everything that we're putting out in the market is validated with a community. And our fourth, which, which really gets to bringing innovation and disruption to the enterprise, is avoid holding innovation efforts to executional standards. And we'll dive deep into what that means as well. So, how can we apply these practically? Well, we have a process that we use in order to innovate new products, in order to help our customers innovate new products. It follows a number of different paths that have sort of been combined into a recipe that, that we use, but it pulls heavily from the Stanford D School, design thinking, from the Lean Startup methodology, and what it really starts with is the customer. You want to start with a customer, a customer problem. You want to start with what, what a customer needs, and most importantly, start with research. You use real customers. Don't make them up because they fit your product, your existing products, or what your company already does well. This is, a, this is a mistake that lots of companies make. They assume that since they build things, people are already buying them. What they should do is go figure out how they can build, 
bigger and better versions of what they make for bigger and better versions of the customers they already have. Finding that overlap between what your customers need and what you have the capacity to do is really the, um, the, the important step here. And uh, the, the one that Neil asked me to add to this was get out of the office. And I think that's, that's an, an important tenet. I don't know if you want to explain what you mean by that, but it's a, it's a pretty important one. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, I have a story to kind of share about Urban Airship's uh, beginnings. And um, the, it started back in 2009, and the CEO and at the time, he went down, and he's the current CEO, he went down to um, the Worldwide Developers Conference down in Apple. He didn't actually have a ticket to get in, okay? And these guys are trying to build a push notification infrastructure. It had just come out on iOS. Um, and so he came up with this great idea. He went to Costco and he bought a bunch of Danishes and donuts. And he talked to each one of the developers that were waiting in line to get in. And, you know, that's a great story that exemplifies talking to the customer because right there he was gathering all the problems that the developers were having. And he was able to send that back to his team in Portland to build this product almost like in real time around that. And so, you know, that it's very common in the startup, in startup uh, uh, companies to see that. You know, even in old companies, you see that. Um, but I think as an organization gets larger, and at Urban Airship, we've gotten larger, uh, we lose that. You do need to still go back to the customer and really ask them for what are their problems. Um, a lot of people, it's very easy to jump to the solution that they want or taking a lot of noisy sources and then thinking that's the best problem set to go and solve for, but really going back to the customer and asking them what the problem is um, and not sort of biasing them with the solution. So I think that's a, a really important thing. And as you get larger, um, just going back to the basics of getting right in front of the customer. So that's what I mean by getting out of the office. Yeah, it doesn't happen behind a desk. Yeah, it's crucial. Um, Thanks, Neil. That that's great, and it's a it's a great segue into sort of the next step in our in our ideation process, which is moving from empathizing with your customer to really defining, uh, you know, the benefit that you can provide to them. And as you mentioned, you know, engineers, product designers, it's really tempting to jump straight to the solution because you're working in technologies that you understand. You find something you think would be really cool. Determining before you get to a solution the benefit that you're going to provide. To the, to the customer, you avoid settling on anything prematurely and, and relying on anything that might be, you know, might be un, that might be an unreliable source of data. Um, validating that, it gets into the next step after ideation. Moving into the, the ideation phase, this is where we get into McQuivy's concept of the adjacent possible. Now, I have to preface this by saying that Working for a company like iSight and working with a number of, of different clients in different industries and working with a number of different designers, strategists, and folks who engage in ideation, there are a million and one ways to come up with a million and one ideas. There are lots of different frameworks for ideation, and this is really just one tool in a much larger toolbox. The one that resonates particularly well with digital disruption, however, because of the speed at which it achieves results, is called innovating the adjacent possible. As James explains in the book, innovating the adjacent possible, it refers to identifying the next thing your customers want and quickly giving them the few that are easiest for you to deliver. So you're really capitalizing on and making the best use of the lack of friction in the market, the availability of these tools, and what you can do best very quickly. And it's easy to think about these as kind of software-based things is, you know, everybody thinks it's faster to build software. You don't have to go through all these hardware cycles. And famously, investors are, you know, leery of investing in hardware startups because they're capital intensive. But one of the best examples of the adjacent possible that McQuivy brings up in his book is Jawbone. They had, a, they had a, an incredibly successful run creating Bluetooth headsets. And they hadn't run out of that market, but they definitely were looking to see where they could expand and what they could innovate in order to introduce to the market and disrupt it. And what they found through this ideation process was that they were really good at Bluetooth, and they were really good at sound, and they were really good at connecting things via Bluetooth, and they hadn't built anything that looked like a speaker yet. And what they accidentally came, almost accidentally came up with was the Jambox. And it started as this sort of wireless Bluetooth speaker, but by having experience with headsets, 
they were able to move into that and actually make it a speakerphone as well. And now it's one of the best Bluetooth speakerphones on the market because they had this relevant experience coming up to it. And they looked at what the sort of ne nearest neighbor to what they were doing that they could innovate was. And it's important to think about that as not a, it's not a linear additive process. It's not building a better Bluetooth headset. It's expanding step by step and moving through possibilities, ruling things in rather than out. In an ideation process, it's really important to go for quantity first because you might miss that, you know, that, that serendipitous discovery or that next thing that could be the next big thing. And if you're not open to all of those possibilities, you, you might not see it. Um, the, the path that he talks about taking in this process goes from customer to benefit to strategy to product. And that order is really important. There's a great tendency, as we've said, to jump to the product or jump to the strategy and really starting with that customer and the benefit, it will make clear what the next best thing to work on is. So moving along to the, um, oh, moving along to, oh, there's actually, yeah, so there's a, this is an example of, uh, I'm going to spill our candy in the lobby here. We have a download for you at the end of this at the end of this webinar that's a workbook that after, you, after we've gone through some of these techniques, you can actually use some of these, uh, some of these techniques, try them on your own, um, obviously call us if you have questions, but the idea here is that this is sort of the synthesis of that ideation process that we call the product vision statement. Um, if it looks like a Mad Lib, that's because it is. And the idea here is that through determining who your customer is, determining what the benefit that you can provide them is, establishing what that product that you're going to work on is, if you can boil it down to this sentence, then you're probably on a pretty good path. So you look at who the target customer is, you look at that customer need that they have, um, define the product, give it a name, um, it doesn't have to be the brand you end up with, and then look at that one key benefit that's going to, that's going to provide and what it can do that will differentiate itself from the competition. And Neil, I remember we actually used this technique to great effect when we were doing some work um, with Columbia back a few years ago. And I found that the, the amazing thing about this process is that if you look at classic innovation and product development cycles and processes, they can take forever. They can take weeks, they can take months, they can take years. Using this method, you can arrive at at least a draft of a good next thing to do as an organization, a good next product in the morning or an afternoon. Um, and get, getting, results, getting results and ideas fast is really what this framework is, is built for. So we have an example of some things that we've, um, that we've worked on that use some of these techniques. And I'd like to explain them in both in the context of the techniques we use to build them, but also in the context of, I think, um, what makes them disruptive and why they, why they deserve to be disruptive. So Dash is a startup we worked with. Um, last year, uh, they were in Techstars, and they had a, this awesome idea all around the idea of, um, of driving and that we could make driving better. So what's interesting about this is that Dash connects to commodity onboard diagnostic readers that are now available. So for 15 bucks, you can go to Amazon and buy this little dongle that plugs in underneath the steering wheel of any car made after 1996 and using the smartphones that an enormous percentage of people out there driving have today. So not having to build any new hardware as a company, not having to build any new really proprietary operating system or anything super complicated, they can focus on the experience and what the customer, the driver, who has been woefully underserved by the data producing community, in particular their cars, they can focus on them, give them what they need. So the synthesis of this commodity hardware commodity smartphones, and the ingenuity to put all of the data that comes out of the car that's sitting there but is really an untapped resource, what it results in is this sort of disruptive synthesis where you know, the, the, the ultimate here is that instead of the car computer just flashing an engine light and you having to wonder, I wonder why that engine light is on, and going in and paying a mechanic to tell you why the engine light, light is on and fix it, you can now unlock that data using an iPhone app that connects directly to your car that will tell you how soon the repair should be made. Using the internet, identify the top rated on Yelp shops where you might go and get it repaired and let you actually turn that light off if you've done it yourself. And for anybody who changes their own oil 
or does anything to their own car, the ability to actually turn those engine monitoring lights that come on off, it's really empowering as a customer. And that's really at the heart of digital disruption. These guys have taken something that used to be a closed system and where you used to have to go and, um, and go to either a mechanic or a dealership, and they've opened it up to the people by using this disruptive technology. The process of getting to this was not easy. We started with a premise when we worked with Dash that people will want to know all kinds of things about driving. And if you think about the fact that all of this data that comes off of your car, it, it, it can give you data overload. And so carefully shaping what data we share with the customer requires asking them what they're interested in. So there was a process of um, user research and ideation that went on here that resulted in, over the course of the design of this product, a real refinement down to focusing on the critically important things to drivers, and that is making them safer drivers, making them more efficient drivers, and helping them keep their cars in shape better, and helping them repair them more consistently. Everything else sort of that we thought would be neat, like telling your friends you're going on a trip, sharing things socially, they all became peripheral. And the reason they all became peripheral is that we validated and tested early prototypes of this with real customers and found out what they were really using. And that's something that you can actually do now relatively easily. Whereas before, in order to test market something, it, it took a tremendous effort. Now, you can use Test Flight on an iPhone app to get a version of this out to anybody. And you can either send them an OBD reader or have them you know, download it themselves, or have them go buy one from Amazon themselves. And you can get real results back in a day from somebody that you want to have test something out. So the, the cycle for getting customer insight has shortened tremendously because of technology, but you have to take advantage of it. Another great example uh, from, our, from our, our work here at iSight is a company that's in our Type Pearl incubator and in that you know, we feel they're really revolutionizing the way people pay for transit. They are a mobile ticketing company and they were a, a first, which we love. They're the first system-wide mobile pay in use. So you can buy one ticket, use it on trains, use it on streetcars, use it on buses. It's all visually authenticated. And it cuts out of the loop a lot of clunky and unreliable hardware-based solutions. Again, leveraging these commodity smartphones, the ubiquity of GPS and the internet. And they'll tell you also when your bus is coming, which a paper ticket has no way of doing. The process of getting here again it really leveraged that design school, design thinking process where going through iterations and testing these, these paper prototypes with the, the actual customers who were going to be using it. And then once we had a working system, um, getting that out into the field and having people test it, that was crucial to it. There's a sense here, I think, that a lot of people might think, oh, well, this is a startup. It's easy to go out and test things in the wild. But this is a startup that was building this with the help of and the cooperation of a major metropolitan transit agency. That's an enterprise, and to work with them and actually get a product that's this disruptive built is a huge win. But it requires following that process and really teaching the enterprise to work more like a startup. And that really is, I think, at the heart of how we make this a mission and how we, how we put it into place in larger enterprises. I think um, we've, we've all seen startups be really successful doing things quickly and coming in and disrupting the market, well, there's a, obviously a danger if you're a larger company that something that your company does may be in danger of being disrupted by an upstart. Um, so trying to con convince your organization to try this and convince them to put it in place in a, in a relatively straightforward way, um, it's, it's, a, it's a difficult thing to do. For one thing, Oh, yeah, I was just yeah, going to talk Neil, about, to um, here. yeah, the one thing I wanted to talk about, too, is even at, you know, once a company has moved out of the startup phase, um, you know, another example from Urban Airship is we're, we're, we have a lot more customers now, and so um, we still use this minimal viable product idea, um, and what we try to do is we establish the viability based on what the customer's problems are and a set of those problems that we can go and solve, not what engineering can do you know, in a certain time period. So you really want to try to focus on those customer problems and then come back and quickly, you know, with these tools that are available to quickly create a wireframe or even a high fidelity prototype, take that and put it back in front of the customers and see, does it truly get to the 
problems that they were trying to have addressed. And if they are or not, you go back and iterate on that prototype very quickly. Once you've kind of decided, yeah, okay, we think we've matched some of these problems, then you can go and build that. And having that um, kind of focus, that brutal focus on creating a minimal viable product really leads you to that. And I think you kind of got to that with the ODB, uh, the, the car sensor thing. Yeah, there's well. definitely, there's a tension between engineering and the concept of a minimal viable product this is what we found over and over again because there's this idea that this idea that survives from from earlier versions of the enterprise that more features equals better and that the more you can make a product do you know you end up with this massive switch army swiss army knife that's too big to put in your pocket um, there's a great example of this that's, that's sort of the classic example of the difference between a minimum viable product and, and a miss in that category is the difference between um, the zune and the ipod you know and they built the first Zune, it, they just kept cramming more and more and more features in it. The thought that that's how you beat Apple, that's how you make a better product, is that you make it do more. And the, the essence of it really is you, you, what you actually want to do is more elegantly solve the customer's problem. Yep. And that's, that's at the heart of it. If it only does one thing, that's good. Right. Yeah. And we've seen that customers love being able to get their input in the product that you're going to create next. Mm -hmm. um, and so they really enjoy that and they give lots of meaningful um, information back to the product designers. Yeah. For sure. Um, so when we think about how to put this into place in enterprise organizations, Neil, I know you have a lot of experience in this area and can probably speak to some, some examples of that. Um, one of the things that we found is that larger organizations being risk averse, they they have this, they're wary of prematurely sharing results with customers. They don't want to show anything that has the company brand on it that might, uh, that might, cause, uh, mis, that might cause, uh, cause miscommunication or not end up getting released. And the fact is, though, that there's sort of a, there's a counterpoint to this that iteration and rapid prototyping, rapid ideation processes, they can actually mitigate risk because they help you test things and, and, low, they, and test things and fast fail them you have a much lower initial cost, you get faster results, and your path to validation is much faster if you actually take that prototype out and show it to customers. So getting over some of that fear is really I think, a crucial step. Another important element in this is really keeping those teams small. Um, we, we've seen a number of organizations where when a new initiative comes into place, you get this sort of you know, Cheerios in the, in the milk kind of phenomenon where they sort of, everybody wants to be part of it, so it gets bigger and bigger and bigger, and there are folks in the organization that you can't say no to. And you can't say, no, you can't be a part of this. We have to keep the team small. But innovation teams are going to get results by being kept at a size that can fit into a small conference room, make decisions quickly, and get examples of things built faster than having to go through multiple layers of, of company approval. Now, obviously, putting things into production and getting things into the, you know, the product stream is another story. But innovating and getting something out that can make a huge change for your company is something that's best left to teams that are kept small enough to be effective. Um, I don't know if you had an example of that from. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I think like the, I've worked in R&D teams in really large companies and then um, R&D teams at smaller companies and right now, you know, the scale that Urban Airship is at, it, it's all about innovation. So kind of stepping back to those two other um, cases where you're in a really large organization um, you know, the things that I've learned is that unless there's really st strong buy-in from basically the CEO to that innovation team, it ends up being one of those things where you, you, can, you can do all of these things, you can go solve the customer's problems, you can create something, but if the executives don't agree that that's something that they want to go and invest more time into, then you kind of waste a lot of time. Um, where I've seen it extremely effective is in um, other organizations where there's, you know, an innovation team reporting almost directly to the CEO or, um, you know, not directly to the CEO, but basically a person that has a real strong agreement with the CEO that the products and things that are kind of come out of the innovation team are really going to be put into the market. Um, and that's where I've seen the most success um, in terms of, uh, organizational structure and then um, yeah just keeping the team small nimble using all the tools that are available trying to go fast not worrying about um, you know 
being held to this like um, enterprise standard, mm -hmm. but really kind of go fast because you will have time once you've found that market um, and people start jumping on, then you will have time to refine that. Yeah, I don't know if you ever made it into the, um, the geology office, one of my favorite Portland startups that is now part of a large enterprise. They have a poster in their office that's, that says, move fast and break things. Yeah. And that's a great, if you're on an innovation team, that's a great sort of words to live by. Um, another, important, another important element here in, in making this work in a large organization is that that team really needs to cross organizational boundaries. If, if you don't have representatives from a variety of different places within the company, and this is difficult to do and keep the team small, a lot of times when they try to keep the team small, it ends up being folks just in design or just in engineering or just in strategy or some, some portion of the company, really making sure that there's a voice from across the company, particularly when this is a new effort, is, is pretty important. And as, as, as Neil mentioned, um, and it bears explaining that resisting holding innovation efforts to ex executional standards, we, we mentioned this earlier on, and Steve Blank has a, has a great investor and advisor, has a great take on this in a post that he wrote, mature enterprises are execution machines. They have KPIs, they have programs in place, they do things a certain way because they found over the years that it works and that it makes money and that they can continue being large organizations. Startups are completely different from that and startups really, they can be a small company, they can be brand new or they can be a team within a larger company. That's the important thing to recognize here is that the lean startup methodology tells us that a startup is just a group of people trying to build something new and operating in an environment of uncertainty. So the mission of a startup is to determine the answer to one question, which is should it exist or not. That's entirely different from those executional standards that you hold an entire enterprise to, like uh, EBITDA and you know quarterly profits and all those things that the stock market loves. You'll never get an innovation out to market if you're holding your innovation team to those standards too early. It's, it's really the kind of thing where your innovation team needs to be protected and allowed to build things that might end up radically changing the way you do business and be open to that and withhold that sort of uh, metric judgment, I guess you'd call it, until later on. And the last one, sort of bonus imperative, um, is what James McQuivy calls disrupt or be disrupted. And I think, I, I think this is it's funny, it's interesting, um, but the idea here is that disruption is both an opportunity and a threat, and the way in which it's a threat is that if you don't figure out what the next thing that your customer wants is, somebody else out there will, and they may not have even formed their company yet, so they're probably not on your radar. So this final imperative, it brings us to some interesting organizational considerations. There are a few techniques that you can use, few high-level organizational methods of setting up an innovation program. There are a lot of nuances and subgenres of these, but the main ones are really, there's really sort of three main, um, three main ways that you can do this. You can, on the one hand, just set up an internal innovation team and get key parts of the company involved, empower that team to produce results outside of the normal company performance metrics. This tends to be the easiest, it's the most common. Um, it can also lead to some friction in your organization where folks who are in more traditional lines of business don't understand what this group of people is doing. The second option is to overhaul the way your entire company works and really disrupt your entire chain of product development. This takes a massive organization-wide effort and it's difficult. It's rare, but it can yield some amazing results uh, even if it does lead you to completely new markets and ways of doing business. The third way though that we've seen in a couple of examples that I think is pretty interesting is this idea of being sneaky. You could set up, for example, a physically separate subsidiary of your company, um, keep it off the radar from other people, and really set it up as a competitor that's chartered with disrupting what you do as a company. There's an, one example of a company that did this. They set up a board of directors from within the main company and made them the board of directors of this startup that they had spun out, sort of a Building 43 kind of thing. So there's still oversight, and there's still reporting, and there's still you know, responsibility and accountability but it gives your innovation team uh, really the kind of cover and, and, um, and over, cover and oversight that, that you get when you're a startup with a board of directors. And it also gives them a focus on a key competitor that they're trying to disrupt, which is their own company. Um, this is an, an interesting, I think it's an interesting way to do it and we need to see more companies try that. So summing things up before we take some questions, um, you know, digital disruption, it's happening right now, everywhere. 
The rules have changed. It's a new market out there, new ways of doing business. All types of companies can do this. It works a lot better if you follow a process. There are a number of processes out there, and we have a downloadable tool that you can use to start working through some of these processes coming up at the end of the webinar. And while it's challenging for traditional companies to do, that, do this, there are ways to get there. So we had hoped to leave a little bit of time for Q&A. We have about nine minutes left. So if, um, if we have some questions that have come in, we'd love to go ahead and answer them. I was a question from Doug, will you be willing to share the slides? Absolutely, we can make those downloadable. We'll actually be posting a replay of this if anybody would like to watch it later. Any other questions before we break? Um, okay, we have one that's being run up here from our very politely quiet studio audience. Um, do you think digital disruption will become the norm and that we're at an inflection point where entrenched business models are surprised by it? and that won't be the case in the future. I think there's definitely something to that. What, what we're finding, I think if you think about crowdfunding is now pretty well understood by most people. Uh, five years ago, the idea that you would go around to you know, 100,000 different people and get small donations in order to start a company was, somebody might have called you a crackpot, but now the idea that, that, it, that that's the way that, that you can fund a new company and really get pre-orders for a product is it's, it's understood. So there, I think there are examples of it that have become the norm. There are ways that digital disruption can, can help companies that have become more mainstream and more understood. Um, overall, the, I think as an institutional phenomenon, whether or not the mass of large enterprises out there really take this and make it the way that they make new products is, is up for grabs. Um, we'll see. Neil, did you want to weigh in on that? Yeah, I mean, I think I think of it in terms of like the customer adoption profile, like that bell curve that everybody sees, where you have like the early adopters or um, early majority, late majority, and laggards, and you know this idea that a startup is trying to find the market, and then after that point, once the market has been found, then you're sort of this company that's executing. I think the relative pace of that is going to just keep going faster and faster um, because what you're doing is you're solving these problems and changing the way that people interact and solve these problems in their daily lives. So you're changing the w way that they behave. Um, and I think it's just going to be a, kind of a natural thing where you're going to have startups displacing other things. So if you know large companies want to maintain their uh, market share, they're going to have to adapt these same sorts of things. But I think, you know, that it also goes back to there'll be that startup companies like that find the market and then they get acquired, right? So there's also that piece of it as well. Absolutely. Great. So it looks like we are just about out of time and just about out of questions. Oh, wait. Here we go. We have one from uh, Drew. Do you have any advice on how to sort out what problems customers are, have are really important or nice to have? Potential customers can be very gracious in interviews. Absolutely. Um, interviews are really only one part of customer research. There's, um, there's more kind of objective first-person observation. There's focus groups. There's you know, competitive analysis of what other products are out there, and there's measuring what they actually do. You know, they may say that they want one particular feature, but if you, you know, look at your existing product, particularly if it's digital, and you can engage in kinds of things like, you know, web metrics and things like that, um, really measuring and, and applying a kind of a, a multivariate analysis to your customer, and then taking all of that and you know shaking it out, shaking it up, putting it all together, and saying, okay, out of all of this, what rises to the surface as as the really important as the really important benefits? Um, there's another Im important kind of sideline to that, and that's that it's at this stage, it's really better to say yes than no. Um, it's it's a whole lot if you if you sort of take a bunch of different potential things and say no to all but one of them, it can be stifling if you kind of let everything in at the beginning, and this is that 
that whole idea of ideation, starting wide and starting with quantity before you before you boil it down, um, that'll help determine what the overlap between those features that you're you're considering and the benefits that they may provide to customers are. But you know, the short answer is really use a variety of different research techniques and not just customer interviews, though those are crucial. Neil, did you have a thought on that? Yeah, I mean, exactly what you said. Um, and then also, if you are doing customer interviews, um, digging in a little bit, but we like to use this term 5Y, um, which is kind of a root cause analysis tool, but you ask, you know, if, you, if they're giving you lots and lots of problems, you really try to get to the heart of the problem, um, and you ask why five times, so you, you know, it's like, well, um, I'm always cold. Well, why are you cold? Oh, because, you know, I'm sitting in this corner of the room. It's like, well, why are you sitting in that corner of the room? Oh, because that's where my boss put me. Well, you know, you start asking these whys, and um, you eventually, like, find out, okay, like, I sit next to the vent, you know, that's blowing cold air on me. So that helps you kind of understand exactly what the root cause is. Um, but that lets you basically kind of tease out which problems are really important to them and which ones can be solved by other things. Because a lot of the problems can be solved by other methods, and so you want to really figure out what the root cause is and determine if your solution will be able to solve that or not. Um, but yeah, chiming in, like, you know, there's discovery from the interviews and then validations through surveys mm -hmm. can be helpful. Well, great. I'd like to thank everybody, both here and online, for staying with us today and hanging in for an hour to learn about digital disruption. If you have any follow-up questions for us, you may feel free to contact uh, myself or Neil at the URL at the bottom of the screen, isightdesign.com slash disrupt. You can find out a little bit more about the practice of digital disruption and download that ideation template that I mentioned, so feel free to do that and we will look forward to hearing from you soon. So thank you everybody for joining us today. Thanks.